So it's writable now. It's not finished. It'll never actually be finished. I'll just get sick of it and move on to the next project. But now's a good time to sort of give you a bit of a rundown on belt driven one wheel and whether or not it's actually a good idea or not. And that's pretty much what this project was about. It wasn't about building a, a working one wheel. I would have just got a Fungineers kit or something like that. It was about a bit of an experiment to see if this idea was like even, even reasonable. So I think we all know that it wasn't actually Kyle at Future Motion that was probably the guy that first came up with this concept of like a, a, a one wheel based on a go-kart tire and that sort of thing. It was actually a guy called Ben Smither over in the UK back in 2000 and 2007 that sort of put together something that actually looked like this. Kyle wasn't far off though. He was like probably a year or, year or two later. And there were about six or seven other um, one wheels that were put together by by different guys sort of around that same time period as well like quite a few people were actually messing with the concept the one thing that was common across all those builds was that they were all either like belt driven like like this one or, or chain driven and i mean there's reasons why you might consider a belt drive these these days but back then the main motivating fact was that there was simply no hub drives that were like suitable for a board like this and now there is, uh, but it wasn't until about 2015 when One Wheel appeared on the, on the scene with their Kickstarter that uh, One Wheel's actually got a hub motor instead of like a, an externally mounted motor. The first thing most people usually say when they pick up a One Wheel is, geez, it's a heavy little thing. And that's because of this, the, the motor in, inside the hub on a Pint or one XR or a GT, they, they weigh about six kilos which is quite a, quite a percentage of the entire board. And that's the reason for that is when you're designing a motor to have like lots of low speed torque, which, which this needs because there's, there's no reduction, you need a lot of iron and you need a lot of copper in your motor. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. I'm sure there's more technical breakdowns as to the exact motor characteristics you need, but more iron, more copper will give you low speed torque. This motor is rated for, I don't really like motor ratings too much. They sort of seem to be all over the place and a little bit inconsistent and hard to believe. But I've heard this motor is rated for 750 watts in some places up to like three horsepower, I think was in the last one wheel future motion presentation. So that's about 2,500 watts. And I think that's a, it's a pretty realistic sort of number, number for that motor. The motor in the belt driven one wheel is, is quite a bit different obviously and this this isn't the motor that i have in the one wheel but it's probably pretty close to the one in the one wheel is actually a bit bigger this is a radium 6384 motor it weighs about a kilogram and it's rated for about 7000 watts for they say 15 seconds and i'd actually believe it would do 15 seconds at that sort of wattage um, after that, it's gonna get very, very hot very, very quickly and probably not do so well. Um, so a continuous rating is gonna be a bit more hard to sort of sort of knuckle down and, and get down for sure. But there's a definite advantage here in that you've got a motor that can put out a significant amount of power that weighs the sixth of what you've got in the, in the one wheel. So I guess that's the main benefit towards going for a, a belt driven setup. I guess you, you sort of wonder how such a small motor can produce um, even more power than the six kilogram motor that's inside a one wheel. And the reason for that is because it just doesn't produce the same amount of torque as, as what the, the one wheel motor does. This one will actually, this the, the KV rating on this motor is 125, whereas the, the KV rating on the, on the one wheel motors is about like 14 or so. So really this motor is gonna spin about 10 times as quick as, as that motor for the, for the same voltage. And what that means is that in order to get the same amount of torque from, from this motor as what you would for that one, you're going to have to reduce its, its drive by a, a ratio of about 1 to one to 10. And that's really the, the core concept behind um, incorporating some sort of reduction system into a, a one wheel. It's that you get to take advantage of smaller, more powerful motors that need to spin quicker to produce the, the same amount of power. One of the other nice things about these motors is you can get them pretty much anywhere. Like they're, they're pretty popular in like uh, electric skateboard sort of circles and, and, and vendors. Um, definitely the, the 63 millimeter size motors are, are everywhere. 
the 8100 size motors that is, is actually in here are a bit harder to find, but they're still very available and you can like pick them up off a number of AliExpress stores and other web stores as well. They're also like a, a fair bit cheaper than like one wheel hubs or um, like the, the Canon Core from Float Wheel or the Super Flux from, from Functioneers as well. This, this motor I can get here in Australia for about $200 shipped whereas um i think i looked up the fungineers hub the other day and that was going to cost me about 500 us dollars to, to actually get here in australia shipping actually costs quite a lot because it's as i said before it's quite a big heavy motor i'm not sure if you can make it out on the side but this is an 11 by 6.5 wide by 5 size cart tire and it's so it's roughly the same size as like your, your average one wheel XR tire. The one thing that's different is, is this last number. So the five, it's, it refers to the rim diameter, which is five inches in this case. And one wheels, except for the GT, have a six inch hub. And I, I sort of saw that as like maybe a, a bit of an advantage because it means that the sidewall is actually like half an inch taller on each on each side of the, each side of the wheel. So maybe that helps with like bump absorption or, or maybe it helps when you when you sort of lean the board because you've got more sidewall to sort of compress when you're, when you're turning and, and that sort of thing. I don't actually know if it's an advantage. Um, I'd be interested in getting some other people's opinions as to how they thought of the, the five inch um, hub road compared to say like a, a typical XR, but that's something for, for much further on down the track. Another nice thing about not having your like motor inside the wheel is that these these tires are, are very cheap. Um, like a, this is a, a wet tire for, for carts, and it cost me like seventy seventy dollars Australian, I think. Um, whereas uh, in a float life enduro it was going to cost me like two hundred and fifty dollars or something. So that was nice. The cart wheels are also cheap as well. Um, so I don't think you really worry about too much about changing tires what you probably do is just like go and buy like another another rim with a with another tire if you wanted to like switch between say like slicks and and treaded tires um this one here i actually bought before before this wheel um you can actually see like it's meant to be 4.5 inches wide which is the same as the the pint tire but it actually came out significantly slimmer than that so I bought this and then sort of looked at it and I was like, look, it's not something I really want to ride on, on the one wheel. Um, so let's, let's get something a bit, bit wider. Um, but I'm still interested to try this, this slip tire at some stage. And the great thing is all I have to do is like unscrew these two bolts, um, same on the other side, drop out the wheel, change the, the wheel hub over and I've got like a, a new, new wheel tire on the, on the board. The last advantage I'll give is that this sort of board with the motor not being inside the wheel sort of opens up a lot more options as far as obviously wheel and tire choice goes. I found out the other day that Hoosier actually does like a 12 by 8 inch tire and thought it'd be really interesting to build this sort of board around a, a tire that size because you could have a lower center of gravity and sort of keep the same amount of ground clearance as what you have on, on this board as well. You couldn't really do that on an XR for example because um, the tire is going to be too wide for the, for the wheel hub. Um, and you can't really adjust the, the torque put out by the, by the motor on an XR either, like, like you can with this sort of belt-driven setup. So it was an in interesting idea and, I don't know, maybe one for a, for a later day. We'll see how that goes. Um, on to the disadvantages, which, which are fun. So the, the easy ones to deal with is, like, if you're a company like Future Motion, we, we know they don't really like people messing around their boards. If you've got a pulley set up like this on your board, it would be hours before someone came along and started switching out pulleys to give them more top speed or, or more low end torque. Um, and that's not something that they want to support. It's also a more maintenance heavy sort of solution. So every time I go for a ride, you sort of obviously want to go out and check to make sure the, the belt still has enough tension to, to stay on track for you. And it's definitely not an easy thing to sort of build in your garage, I'll say that much. With a, with a hub drive set up, all you've really got to worry about is, is getting your rails and make sure your rails mount onto the motor axle all right. And if you've got that down, you, you can build up a working board pretty easy. Whereas with this, you obviously have the whole axle set up, which you have to do much the same. 
but you also need to make sure your motor's mounted in here and it's like you can adjust the tension and make sure that the whole setup is rigid enough so you don't get any flex whatsoever in your, in your belt drive setup because that would be bad. Because the last advantage, disadvantage is you're introducing an additional point of, well, where something could go wrong. If this belt slips, you're going to have a, have a bad time and there's, there's no way around that really. If you've ever ridden an electric skateboard, then it probably had belts on it much, much like this. This is a HTD high torque drive 5M, so five, five millimeter pitch um, belt. Pretty, pretty common for most electric skateboards. And here's like a, a 15 tooth, tooth pulley. Um, I built a, built an electric skateboard several years ago. Um, it was, it was pretty good. Didn't really have any troubles with the, with the belt, but under heavy braking, I did get it to skip occasionally. So one of the things I wanted to avoid was was using one of these belts. So instead, um, the the belt I actually have on the on the on the one wheel is um, HDT8, which looks something like that. Um, this is a 15 tooth pulley. Um, this is a HDT8 M pulley. Um, so you can sort of see there's actually quite a quite a size difference between the the two. Um, the, the wheel pulley I use on, on the one wheel is actually from a quarter midget race car and these, this sort of specification of, of belt um, gets used in like quite a lot of heavy industrial sort of places. So you might find a belt like this um, inside your car engine as, as your timing belt. Um, obviously there's a, there's a few carts, most carts are chain driven, some very few are belt driven, but they'll use a, use a belt of, of this sort of specification. So they're pushing a fair bit of horsepower through, through these belts. Um, car superchargers often use HDD 8M belts as well, although they're often about 70 millimeters wide, but still, they're still the same pitch belt. So this is by no means a, a fragile thing. And so far, fingers crossed, I've not actually had any slippage on, on the one wheel. Um, so I'm pretty happy with this setup at, at the moment, but I would not recommend going with a five millimeter pitch belt on your, on your one wheel, that's for sure. So back to the board itself. Unlike one wheels, the battery is actually in the front of this one. Um, that was done because the motor sort of compromises the amount of ground clearance you have. So I wanted to make sure that I had more ground clearance at the front just in case you're going up a curb or something like that. There's not really too much difference between the front end of this, and like the batteries that you'd have on your typical one wheel. Um, I used four, four sensitive resistors for the, for the foot pad, two wide in parallel on, on each side. I wouldn't do that again. I'd just buy like um, one of the aftermarket foot pad solutions. Um, it'll make wiring an awful lot easier and probably perform better as well. Not that I've had any worries with the FSRs at, at this stage. Um, we can flip it over and you'll see the battery pack underneath. This does differ a little bit in that we're running a, a 12S3P MolySell P42A battery pack. So it's the same number and type of cells as what you'll have in a one wheel GT, but it's in a 12S configuration instead of an 18S configuration. So fewer volts, but potentially more amps. Um, we've got a BMS up the front here, which is um, a flexi BMS light. It's a charge only. Um, I think you should be able to plug it up. We'll see it boot up and I'm not sure if you'll be able to make it out on the video, but there's a little OLED display like just up here. Um, and it's hooked up to an Arduino, which is talking to the BMS via CAN bus to actually print out the, the pack voltage and also the voltages of each um, P group within, within the battery pack as well, because I don't know why, but I still can't trust what BMSs are actually doing, especially in DOI projects like this. So it's, it's nice to be able to see the cell voltages. I've already spoke a bunch about the tire and the wheel rim itself, so I won't go back over that. Uh, I will talk about this thing though. This is the, the wheel hub, I guess you'd call it. Um, and this runs on the axle that, that runs through the middle of a wheel. So in here we have a, have a bearing pressed into each side. So it's a hub that actually spins. Uh, we've got one side that bolts onto the, the wheel rim itself and the pulley bolts onto the other side. 
the one thing I guess I regret about this is that this bolt pattern, because this is a custom machine part, um, I couldn't find anything that would actually do this job. So I designed this up in Fusion 360, sent it off to work uh, with a bunch of money as well, because it's not cheap. And they sent me back two of these. Um, and it's, it's a really nice part, but it's also a very expensive part. What I wished I'd done is included, this is the metric bolt pattern or international standard for cart wheels. There's also a US standard as well. And what you'll find is that every six inch wheel rim I've found uses the US bolt pattern, which won't actually bolt up to these holes, which is a bit of a pain. So if I was to do it again, I'd have two sets of holes on, on this side is what I guess I'm saying. The back end of the board is probably where all the interesting stuff happens. So I'll go through it with it all covered up and then, then wet the covers off so we can see what's going on inside. Um, but you can sort of see how much further bulge out the, out the bottom you sort of get with the, with the 80 millimeter motor being in there. Um, to sort of deal with that, I guess, there's the motor mount here, which is another CNC'd aluminium part. So it's, it's quite stiff. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted it to be so strong is so that if you actually didn't actually ground it out, you're not going to, to damage it or the motor. And it actually extends past the sort of outer diameter of the motor that is spinning just under this cover as well. So the cover itself is like a, it's just a 3D printed piece of plastic. Um, I've got some louvers in there because maybe I was thinking about cooling a little bit or maybe I just wanted to, to look a little bit special, I guess. Um, so let's whip this off, which is not the quickest process. One of the things I'd probably improve for next time is to use less screws, but here goes anyway. And we're done. There's an easy composites video up on YouTube about making carbon fiber parts with 3D printed molds. I watched it a while ago and always wanted to give it a go. Um, you can't really tell because it's covered in grip tape, but these foot pads are actually made out of forged carbon fiber. Um, you can see the layer lines sort of that came from the 3D printed mold in there still. Didn't need to be made out of carbon fiber, but hey, carbon fiber is cool and like it's a, it's a super stiff foot pad. Um, and it was an interesting way to, to make parts. I'll probably look at using it for, for something else in, in future as well, because um, it's certainly cheaper than getting parts machined um, via a CNC service, that's for sure. Um, so back to the board itself. We've obviously got the motor here. I'll grab the radium motor that I had out before, so you can sort of get like a, a brief sort of size comparison. So you can sort of see um, it's not like a massive difference between the two but this one weighs one kilo that one weighs probably about 1.8 kilos I think um, so it's, it's a bit bigger uh, the main difference is this is a, a 50 kb motor um, the reduction I'm running with the with the belt drive is a is a four to one reduction um, so for every four times the motor goes around the, the wheel goes around once um, and with, with that in mind, when you divide the, the 50 kV by the, the reduction ratio, you sort of get down to around the same sort of kV. It's what the one wheel motor has itself. So like the, the XR and the GTs. So it makes a bit of a sense. So I'm not running field weakening on at the moment. So it's top speed's about 26 kilometers an hour. Um, but I'm happy, I'll, I'm happy with that for now. Let's just say that. Uh, we've got the two motor mounts on each side. You can sort of see the, the groove just in just in there. To adjust belt tension, both these motor mounts move, move forward and backward. And they're tensioned by these four big screws here. Um, one of the painful things about this design that I'd probably redo differently next time around is that everything I took apart just before needs to be removed in order to adjust the tension of the belt so it's no small feat if, you, if your belt does get a bit slack you sort of need to pull everything apart which is annoying over here we have a few set screws um, and the idea here is that if one of these screws were to get loose um, it would it shouldn't matter too much because we've got these these set screws in here that actually stop it from sliding forward enough so even if these screws get loose, the, the motor and the belt should still remain in, in tension um, and not slip and put you on your ass, which, which would be great. This little black box here is the Bluetooth module, which, which talks to the BESC. Um, 
it's sandwiched between an aluminium plate and a carbon fiber foot pad, but it actually works amazingly well with, with that considered. So underneath we have a Trampa VESC 6 Make 5. It's a nice speed controller. It does nice things like turn itself off if you forget about it. And that's pretty, pretty sort of cool, saves killing battery pack. I've got the power switch over here, which is a nice momentary one. This little box here actually has the, the pull down resistors for the, for the foot pads up front. Um, we've obviously got the, the motor there, which you can sort of see usual sort of outrunner sort of setup, um, mailing power systems. Um, this motor is censored, uh, but we're not actually using the, the sensors that are within the motor um, in this setup. You can see that the sensor cable actually runs around the outside here to this other little box um, just there. Inside here I have a AS5047 encoder. Um, it's basically a little chip that picks up on uh, a magnetic field from a magnet you attach to the, to the end of the motor shaft there. And I posted up some results in, a, in another YouTube video, which you'll find on my channel. And it really made quite a big difference to the low speed torque. And, and when I say low speed, I mean when you're sort of like stationary or crawling along like one, two, three kilometers an hour sort of speed. Um, above that, I don't think it really made much of a difference, but um, certainly for scenarios like where I was riding through some longish sort of grass, I was getting a lot of cogging before, but with that encoder, all those problems went away. One of the design considerations I was pretty conscious of when I was sort of drawing all this up was trying to get heat out of the system, I guess. So we've got the vest here and it's obviously got a, an aluminium heat sink in its, in its own right. That aluminium heat sink is bolted down to the, the actual frame itself. Um, so unlike other one wheels, this frame, it's, it's all solid aluminium um, and it's all welded together. So there's like a, a cross member that runs across the top of the, the battery compartment. There's another um, cross member that runs across here that the, the motor mounts bolt onto. It's all welded together. All up, the frame itself weighs 2.5 kilos, which is bad because it's heavy, um, good because it provides a, a generous sort of heat sink for the VESC and the motor itself. I'm not particularly wrapped that both the motor and the vest, the two hottest things in this whole build, are within the same sort of region uh, because, I mean, you could get a situation where the motor's getting hot and actually heating up the vest, which is certainly not ideal. I took it for a ride the other day. It was a longish sort of ride. It was a hot day. It was 37 degrees outside. This motor doesn't have a temperature sensor in it, something that I'll probably change in the short term future. I got halfway through that ride, reached in and sort of touched the, the outside of the, the motor mount and it was very hot, um, hot enough not to be able to touch it to, for too long. The interesting thing was that I could also like hold the, hold the frame out here and it was also very hot. So, I mean, it's bad that it was hot. It's good that the thermal conductivity is actually like working as, as a sort of plan. So that's, that's quite nice. So it actually balances. You got like heavy battery in that end, heavy motor in this end, and sort of like evens itself out. So like sometimes it sits nose down, other times it sits tail down. It's a bit annoying to be honest, but on the upside, if one of the foot pads did get like stuck on, it's not gonna ghost away on you. It's just gonna sort of sit there and balance, which I guess is a nice backup option really. But that's a, that's a minor detail. So I guess the big question is, how does it actually ride? And the answer is that it rides fine. Like you'd be surprised. It doesn't feel any different to the, to the point that I've got as well. It's, um, it's obviously got better range. Um, the tire's much wider and I run it at a lower PSI. So it's, much, it's a much nicer ride, it feels more secure, um, eats up the bumps a lot easier and that sort of stuff. But, I'm not convinced that like that's a definite advantage of the belt driven system versus a hub drive. Um, I reckon you'd probably get the same on an XR, which I've never ridden by the way. As far as it's like other performance goes, it's range is going to be a lot better because the battery packs probably like three times the size of what's in the pint. As far as the amount of power the, the motor puts out, it's definitely more powerful than the pint. Like I can go up grassy hills that the pint wouldn't tackle very well. And those sort of instances where you're sort of going up a, a hill and you sort of feel like it's struggling a bit and if you pushed it more, you know it a nosedive. It happens much less frequently on, on this board. I guess the, the big thing is that it's not an awful lot better. It's a, it's a little bit better. And to go to this much effort, it would be nice if it was a bit better. So I guess 
I'm not really exploiting the full capabilities of the battery. I think what's letting me down at the moment, I've, I've been watching the, the best temperatures and, and they seem to be in check with the amount of amps I'm pushing into the motor. I think what's letting me down most at this stage is, is the actual motor itself. And the reason for that is the, the 50 kV motor I have in there, like 50 kV is much higher than the kV of one wheel motors, but it's actually quite a low kV motor for this that size sort of brushless out, outrunner motor. And to get that lower kV, one of the ways you, you can reduce the kV of a motor is to include more windings around each one of the SATA teeth within, within the motor itself. To get more windings in, you need to reduce the gauge of the, the, gauge of the wire in the motor, and that also reduces the current carrying capability or ups the resistance, and you get a lot more heat out of the motor. It gets saturated much more easy. And I think that's what's happening here. Like I tried a few experiments. Um, sometimes I'd run 100 motor amps. Other times I'd drop it down to 70. And I didn't really notice a lot of difference in performance. And I think effectively what's happening is that difference in, in amps, like that 30 amps between the 70 and the 100, it's just going to heat. And that's why things were heating up so much the other day when I, when I took it out for that ride. And I don't have... A particularly good solution for that. I think there's there's two ways you could go about it. You could look at finding, you could stick with the 8100 motor and look at increasing the amount of reduction you've got in your drive system. So there's no way I can fit a smaller motor pulley on it. The smaller motor pulleys don't exist for for this gauge, this pitch belt. I could go a bigger wheel pulley, but they're sort of hard to track down as well. So I think what I'd be up for is probably a two-stage reduction, which is mechanically a lot more complex and would probably mean I'd have to pack a, a gear drive in here in addition to the belt drive as well, which is maybe getting a bit complicated. Another solution is to look at other motors. So I was saying before how if you want a motor that's good with low speed torque, you need a lot of iron, you need a lot of copper in there. So I could go at looking at a bigger motor but the problem there is like i start to eat into that ground clearance at the at the back which i'm already struggling with so that may not be a particularly good solution either so i'm sort of stuck between two hard places there so i need to need to do a bit of thinking about it so as, apart from that the other things which i'd probably look at changing is obviously the tensioning system so you saw me take apart everything before that's what you have to do to tension the belt It'd be nice if there was just like an idler pulley over, over here somewhere that you could adjust to change the belt tension. And that would probably also improve the engagement of the, you get more teeth engaged in the belt um, just because of the angle of the belt approaching the, the motor pulley at the back, which would be nice. I'd like to make things a bit wider. So at the moment, this board weighs 13 kilos, which isn't too bad compared to a GT, which weighs about 16 kilos, I think. Uh, the frame is obviously one place where you could cut out a lot of weight. Uh, I didn't have access to a fancy CNC or anything like that. This frame is actually chopped up using the, the hacksaw on the, on the wall behind me. I probably wouldn't weld the frame together again either. I think I'd like to keep it so you could actually like pull it apart and maybe experiment with like different widths of, of the board. Say for example, if you wanted to try a much wider wheel you'd be able to do that um, because at the moment it's all welded together. So it's sort of lock, I'm locked into this sort of size wheel, which is okay, I guess. Okay, so that's it for this video. It's already been going on for way too long. If you've got any questions, just drop them in the comments and I'll get to them pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, next video, I think I'll try and get out and capture some ride footage, which should hopefully be, more, be a bit more exciting. So congrats if you actually made it through this much of a video. Um, it's a bit of a drag. Hopefully the next one's going to be better. Thanks for watching.